Welcome to Wheels Boy. For years now, the convertible lifestyle has been reserved for those who are, at the very least, mildly affluent. In the United States, the most affordable convertible is currently the $29,000 Mazda Miata. But take heart, my fellow middle class people, for a revolution is at hand, and it comes in a very tiny package. This is the Wuling Hongguang Mini EV Cabrio, and it starts at just $14,000 USD. Welcome to Wheels Boy, where we cover the newest, coolest, and wildest vehicles from the Chinese car market. Be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the bell. This is now the third time we've reviewed the Mini EV here on the channel, and it's come a long way both stylistically and price-wise since we first saw it in 2020. In terms of price, the first car we reviewed was around 4,500 USD. Then we reviewed a upgraded version called the Game Boy that was around 9 or 10,000. Now we're all the way up to 14,000. Stylistically, well, it's definitely a little bit different than the original, but the biggest difference is obviously that drop top. You'll notice that we have the top down. That's because with the top up, this thing has a pretty hideous proportions. It looks like a beetle, not a Volkswagen beetle. I mean a nasty little beetle you would find crawling on the ground. It still rocks 12 inch wheels with 145 tires, a little wider than a bike tire. It also still has a single absolutely massive door that weighs more than the last one that I used. I'm hoping that's because they put more structural reinforcement in here to both protect me in the event of a crash and keep this thing from having the structural rigidity of a wet noodle. But maybe I'm just being optimistic. Speaking of the structure, they've integrated two roll hoops here in the unlikely event, hopefully, that we roll this thing over. They've also got a trunk lid, except it doesn't open. I feel they probably just left this trunk lid kind of cut line because it was cheaper than redesigning the entire rear end. There is a cargo space, but I'll show you that when we get inside. So there's no trunk, but there is cargo space in the form of this zippered pocket behind the two seats. It's actually pretty big when you get in there, but getting in there is the problem. In order to do that, you gotta make sure the seats moved all the way forward, climb in, and then just kind of reach back it's a lot of space, but it's not the best solution I've ever seen. Unsurprisingly, the interior of the Cabrio is pretty much the same as the last Game Boy that we drove. That means you have seats like a public bus and a plastic quality, like a public toilet. It's also one of the most manual electric cars you're ever going to find. It's got a manual handbrake here. There's only R and D. There's no P. There's no park function here, like a manual. Uh, there's also manual locks on the doors, manual air conditioning here, and a very old school little display for the radio, but it does still have Bluetooth and three USB ports here in the front. This is also the first car that I've driven in a long time, and I don't just mean the first EV, I mean the first car of any kind of powertrain that has a normal key. Let's see if I can remember how to do this. Hey, I still got the touch. Up here is a seven inch digital instrument cluster which contains pretty much all the information that you can get out of this thing. Down there, by the way, it also still retains the pedals that are basically in the middle of the cabin. This thing has more pedal offset than a 70s Italian sports car. Despite being almost 4,000 US dollars more than the Game Boy version we drove, this thing is actually short a couple of features. One of them is the voice control system that's available on that car. Honestly, that's probably because they didn't have any place to install the microphone. Opening and closing the top is pretty simple. It's a combination of hitting the button here this thing closes pretty quickly, but it opens much faster. Then we grab this handle, twist, and fold. Opening is obviously the reverse. Pull down, twist to unlock, then hit that button right there. As you can see, a little bit faster that way. This thing rocks the same 26.5 kilowatt hour battery pack as the Wuling Mini EV Game Boy, but instead of a 300 kilometer range on the CLTC cycle, it has a 280 kilometer range because obviously putting a convertible top on it is not great for aerodynamics. It still also only has slow charging. That means eight and a half hours to a full charge. Have you fallen in love with the charming Wuling Mini EV Cabrio and you'd like to make it your own? 
I've got good news. Reach out to us at sales at wheelsboy.cn and we can connect you with a reliable exporter of Chinese vehicles such as this. This isn't going to be easy to say and it's probably not going to be easy to hear, but the driving experience of the Cabrio is even worse than that of the standard Mini EV. It has the same ox cart ride. It also has the same single rear mounted electric motor, making 30 kilowatts and 110 newton meters of torque. However, it's 90 kg heavier than the standard Mini EV, so it's even slower. The steering is also, somewhat amazingly, even worse than the last Mini EV that I drove. It's got this incredibly rubbery, vague steering. You just have no idea what the front wheels are doing. The steering wheel in this car also has a weird habit of kind of darting and flicking back and forth in my hands any speed over 40 kilometers per hour or so. I don't know why it's doing it. All I know is it feels sketchy. The soft top results in NVH that is cartoonishly bad. You no longer have the talking inside of a tin can feeling of the original Mini EV, but wind noise, tire noise, and motor whine are essentially omnipresent at every speed. And don't even get me started on what it's like to be passed by a large truck in this thing. The whole vehicle sways back and forth, and the sound, the sound is deafening. It feels like the truck isn't outside, it's inside the cabin with you. Unlike similarly priced vehicles like the BYD Seagull, this thing has very little in the way of safety equipment apart from an airbag for the driver and one for the passenger. It also doesn't have any kind of cruise control, let alone driver assistance system. Though, now that I think about it, it kind of does have not a cruise control, but a, a speed limiter. You see, in eco mode, this thing's top speed is a mighty 81 kilometers per hour. If you switch it into sport or normal mode, well, I saw 105 kilometers an hour which is kind of funny considering the fact that the official top speed is only 100. But all these complaints tend to fade away once you drop the top and start using this thing like a real cabriolet. It's only then that the magic of this pint-sized cabrio becomes apparent. In the right weather, with the right music and the right views, this thing is absolutely delightful. It doesn't hurt that everyone is your best friend when you are driving a mini EV cabrio. It's just a magnet for positive attention. If you're looking to pick up a potential partner, do yourself a favor, leave the Ferrari at home, drive the mini EV cabrio. Unfortunately, the use case is pretty limited, even more so than your average drop top. When the weather is less than perfect, the Cabrio once again starts to lose its charm. The AC and heating on this thing are weak, so if it is slightly hot or slightly cold out, you're pretty much out of luck. When I picked this thing up, it was about 26 degrees or about 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Warm, but not that hot out. I had a 45 minute drive back to the office, so I decided, hey, I'm gonna close the top close the windows, preserve the range. Boy, did I regret that decision. By the time I returned, and keep in mind, this is with the AC on full blast, I was soaked in sweat. So, in order to enjoy this thing fully, you need to drop the top, and the weather needs to be, well, more or less perfect. But when you drop the top, you absolutely destroy the range. And when you only have slow charging, and it takes eight and a half hours to get to a full charge, that's a serious problem. I know. We shouldn't be surprised that the world's most affordable convertible has some serious compromises, but man, this thing is just not really usable. I know there are those who are going to be upset at me for the way that I talked about this car in today's review. When you see it, you kind of fall in love with it, so criticizing it feels a little bit like, I don't know, a bullying a puppy. But the truth is, it's just too expensive. It costs too much to be considered practical, affordable transportation for low-income families here in China, unlike the original Mini EV, but it's also too impractical to be considered a daily driver for a middle-class family. As a result, I'm afraid that, like most convertibles, it's just going to end up being a plaything for the rich.